Hi, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to um, this afternoon's webinar. We are going to just hold on for probably one more minute as people continue to join. Okay, well hello and welcome to this informational webinar on barriers to immigrant women's health and the health equity and access under the law or the HEAL for Immigrant Women and Families Act. My name is Deodene Baderai. I'm the Reproductive Justice Legal Fellow here at the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum and I'm pleased to be facilitating this webinar today. Um, before I introduce some of our amazing speakers, I have just a few housekeeping items that I wanted to go over. First of all, all lines are currently on mute. We're going to keep everyone on mute for the duration of the webinar, um, but there will be time for questions um, at the end of the entire presentation. So uh, please type your questions into the chat function on the right side of your screen. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can chat it in at any time during the presentation so you don't forget your questions if it's for, some, for one of the earlier speakers. Um, we may not be able to get to all the questions, but we're going to do our best. There has been a slight change in presenters from that which was circulated in our original announcement, and we just appreciate everyone's patience as we accommodate that change in our agenda today. And then finally, this webinar is being recorded. However, it is off the record and closed to the media. So if any media are on the call, we're going to ask that you just hop off now, and we're happy to follow up with you at a later time. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Um, Priscilla Huang will be starting us out with an overview of current restrictions on immigrant access to health care. Priscilla is the policy director for the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, a national health justice organization which influences policy, mobilizes community, and strengthens programs and organizations to improve the health of Asian Americans Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Priscilla directs the organization's policy work on expanding access to health care and coverage, improving the quality of care, increasing data on Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander health, and increasing investments in community-driven health strategies. She also works to develop and build our organization's network, uh, national network of community-based organizations and health leaders. After Priscilla, Kimberly Inez McGuire of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health will be providing us with a community perspective of the issue. Kimberly serves as the, as the Latina Institute's Director of Public Affairs. She directs the communications activities of the Latina Institute and advocates for salud, dignidad y justicia, sorry about my Spanish accent, um, health, dignity, and justice for the nation's more than 26 million Latinas, their families, and communities. Kimberly, Kimberly is a reproductive justice leader and queer Latina with nearly a decade of experience in government relations, movement building, and strategic communications. Kimberly develops and implements intersectional policy change and culture, culture shift campaigns focused on restoring insurance coverage for abortion, reproductive health equity, and promoting health and human rights for immigrant women. Kimberly earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Hampshire College, serves on the Board of Directors for Women's Voices for the Earth, and is studying to become a birth doula. And finally, Shivana Drolwa will highlight an exciting new proactive legis legislative effort to restore health coverage for immigrant women and families. And she will share key messaging points that organizations can use when discussing this effort. Shivana is the Reproductive Justice Program Director at the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, or NAPOF. Shivana coordinates NAPOF's reproductive justice policy priorities. She is passionate about uplifting the status of women in communities she identifies with and has a background in legal advocacy and community education around issues of gender-based inequity and violence. Her experience includes working with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission as a legal clerk, 
working with the anti-domestic violence organization SAKI for South Asian Women, co-chairing a chapter of Law Students for Reproductive Justice, and co-founding the Indo-Caribbean women's organization Jahi Sisters, Jahaji Sisters, where she is now a member of the steering committee. Shivana holds a BA in political science from Fordham University and a JD from Emory University School of Law. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Priscilla, and Priscilla, take it away. Thanks so much, Deodene, um, and thank you to our colleagues um, at Napa, the Latina Institute, and Guttmacher Institute for co-organizing this webinar. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about and go through some of the um, uh, overall restrictions currently in place facing um, immigrants and their families in terms of health care access. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. And I think the um, the concept I want to start out with is really, you know, it's um, healthcare access. I think this is actually true for everybody, but healthcare access in the U.S. is certainly um, a patchwork of different um, can be a patchwork of different programs, services, um, and, and channels for connecting with providers um, and for immigrants and their families, um, this is certainly the case, um, as you'll see uh, when I walk through the different um, programs. But you know, there are a lot of questions arise depending on your status. And indeed, as I, uh, everyone knows, um, your particular immigration status um, in, can uh, mean that you're eligible for one program, but mean could also mean you're ineligible ineligible for a different healthcare program. Um, so today I'm going to just walk through um, uh, very broadly some of the current restrictions um, in the federal means tested benefit programs. Um, I'll touch a little bit on some state programs and then also go through some of the ACA coverage rules. Next slide, please. Um, so the first um, set of slides are going to go through current eligibility restrictions in um, federal means tested public benefit programs. Next slide. And really, the most important thing to understand when you're talking about eligibility for um, immigrants in these programs is to understand the qualified versus the not qualified um, distinctions. So the, the reason um, actually that these two categories came about is because of welfare for reform that happened in 1996. Essentially, um, it changed the rules for eligibility for immigrants and created statutorily defined categories that are called qualified categories. And those you can see listed um, on the slide before you. And essentially, anyone who is not um, on this list of statutorily defined categories is deemed not qualified. Um, so this includes a number of immigrants um, uh, that are termed PRUCAL, um, persons residing under color of law immigrants who um, previously, before 1996, were actually um, eligible for Medicaid and CHIP um, and other programs the same way other immigrants are. Um, but they, those um, categories, immigrants lost coverage. In addition, undocumented immigrants um, uh, fall into this category. And, as well as temporary visa holders. Next slide. So, um, so step one, understanding who's qualified and not qualified. The other piece to, that's important to remember when it comes to eligibility is understanding when somebody becomes eligible. Um, so this rule is commonly known as the five-year bar. Um, and essentially, it means that any uh, qualified immigrant who entered the U.S. on 19 um, on this particular date, which is when welfare reform was enacted, um, or was in a qualified status um, after that date, has to wait at least five years until they can become eligible um, for Medicaid. So the reason this is important is because um, the largest category of immigrants this affects are green card holders. So even though green card holders are a qualified immigrant, they still have to wait those five years um, uh, to get 
uh, to, to become eligible for Medicaid. Um, so it becomes a, a very high bar to, to uh, pass, even though they are of a qualified status. There are some exemptions. So for example, um, humanitarian immigrants, such as refugees, asylees, trafficking survivors, um, can become immediately eligible. They don't have to wait for the five years. Um, uh, but for, for the vast number of qualified immigrants, they are subject to the five-year bar. Next slide. And then uh, another uh, piece that's important to remember is that the five-year bar applies to certain um, public benefit programs. And the term of art here, it's, um, and it's very specific, it's actually a federal means-tested benefit, public benefit programs. Uh, and the reason this is important is because the five-year bar then only applies to the five programs listed on the slide. There are a number of other federal benefit programs, um, such as you know, free, free school lunches and WIC and other programs that um, are not subject to the five-year bar. So that's why it's important to make that distinction. Next slide. So moving a little bit um, I, uh, into the Children's Health Insurance Program, um, the, the rules I just went over apply to Medicaid. And then um, because of the reauthorization of CHIP in 2009, uh, the states um, were given a new option um, to actually waive the five-year bar for lawfully present, lawfully residing um, children and pregnant women. Um, to access CHIP and Medicaid. So this has been a really exciting development that many states have taken up. Next slide. So the, on this slide, you'll see um, this is a chart, a map put together by um, colleagues at the National Immigration Law Center. Um, you can see, get a sense of which states have taken up that option um, for immigrant children, so waiving the five-year bar. Um, there are some states have also on their own um, used state funds to cover all immigrants regardless of status. Um, and then you know, there, are, there are some other programs where um, states have been able to find ways to cover more children um, regardless of status. But just to give you a sense of what those states are, you can see on this map. Next slide. And on the, on the following slide, you'll see a map of how many states have taken up that option for pregnant women. And in addition to that, the dark green states um, also cover some states that have taken up what's called the unborn fetus rule in CHIP, um, which I won't go into right now. But what it has done is allowed some states to um, provide prenatal coverage for uh, for all women, regardless of immigration status. Next slide. So I just wanted to note, um, as I mentioned earlier, some states have um, created their own uh, state-funded programs to fill in some of these coverage gaps. Um, and so uh, there are about 15 states that provide coverage to um, low-income, lawfully residing immigrants who are ineligible for Medicaid and CHIP, um, and a number of states who have found other ways of providing coverage. Um, if you want to know if your state is providing that kind of coverage, um, you can actually go to the National Immigration Law Center's website. They have a great chart, um, which they update um, regularly. Uh, so you can, a state-by-state -state chart that you can look up to see which programs are operating in your state. Next slide. And then uh, last but not least, on the public benefits side, um, undocumented immigrants are barred from all federal means-tested benefit programs. Um, they are eligible for emergency services, such as emergency Medicaid and, and um, covered through EMTALA. Um, but the rules around that have not changed over the years. Next slide. So I'm going to move into um, walking through some of the coverage rules uh, under the ACA impacting immigrants. Next slide. And I think for anybody who has worked on the ACA or heard about it, um, as you know, there 
um, a lot of changes, but essentially um, I'll be covering um, very briefly kind of these main points in terms of expanded access to health coverage. Um, I'm not going to take the time to go over go through these right now, but I think most folks are probably familiar with them and happy to answer more specific questions later. Next slide. I think what's helpful is to think about um, when you're thinking about who's eligible for uh, coverage under the ACA, um, and, and by this I mean marketplace coverage in particular, um, it's, it's probably uh, helpful to think about um, the, the groups, different status groups. So I'll start with naturalized citizens. Um, they uh, have the same access um, uh, rules for affordable coverage as US-born citizens. So they are subject to the individual mandate. They're eligible for premium tax credits and cost-sharing subsidies. Um, they're not subject to any of the restrictions, like the five-year bar, or, or being qualified or not qualified, as I mentioned earlier, in Medicaid or CHIP. Next slide. Um, and then what comes next is a little more complicated. So, um, and, and this is where I think uh, a lot of people, including myself, start to get very confused um, very quickly. So in the ACA, the term of art that's used is not the qualified, not qualified um, categories that I mentioned earlier, um, but lawfully present immigrants. And healthcare.gov actually has a helpful list of um, who is covered by this definition. Um, and it, the good thing is that it, it is an expanded list. So it covers um, qualified immigrants in addition to a number of other um, immigrant categories. Um, so uh, the, the news here is that um, lawfully present immigrants are subject to the individual mandate. They are eligible to purchase plans in the marketplaces um, and participate um, and we're able to participate in those temporary high-risk pools that existed in prior years. Um, they're eligible for premium tax credits and cost-sharing um, reductions. Um, it, however, the same rules that I mentioned earlier with the five-year bar restriction and, and other um, immigrant eligibility restrictions still apply in the Medicaid and CHIP context. Um, and then in addition to that, in August of 2012, um, DACA grantees, so individuals who um, were granted deferred uh, through the Deferred Action of Ch for Childhood Arrivals program um, by the Obama administration, um, there was a rule change that made them ineligible for any ACA Medicaid or CHIP coverage. Next slide. And so, um, the last category, the large categories, are undocumented immigrants. And then um, we've also added DACA to this category due to the rule change. And so the health care options for undocumented immigrants and for DACA um, grantees um, didn't change after the ACA. Um, and, uh, and so they are exempt from the individual mandate. But they're prohibited from purchasing private health insurance plans, um, even at full cost. So they are not allowed to participate at all in um, marketplace in the marketplaces. They're not eligible for any premium tax credits or cost-sharing reductions. And again, the current um, eligibility restrictions on undocumented immigrants in the Medicaid and CHIP context still apply. Next slide. Um, that's my contact info in case uh, anyone wants to reach me. And with that, I will hand it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Priscilla, for that um, great look at the current landscape of healthcare barriers on the federal and state level. Um, now, yes, let's turn it over to Kimberly to provide us with a community perspective. So Kimberly, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Priscilla and Diodine, and thank you so much for um, welcoming me to, to this webinar. Um, so I'm going to start um, uh, next slide by just talking quickly about my organization, the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, you can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so we are a national reproductive justice organization, and we build Latina power to guarantee the fundamental human right to reproductive health, dignity, and justice. 
we do that through leadership development, community organizing and mobilization across the country, um, culture shift campaigns and strategic communications, as well as policy change. Um, and you'll see here some of our very uh, fierce uh, Poderosa activists, uh, many of them themselves immigrants. Next slide. Um, we are also very proud to be a co-founder and co-convener of the National Coalition for Immigrant Women's Rights, or NCIWR. I know many of the folks on this call are members of NCIWR. Um, and uh, we include, and actually I think it, we're over 83 at this point, um, grassroots and national advocacy organizations dedicated to defending and promoting equality for all immigrant women and their families. Um, and just to say quickly, you know, for those of you who've been part of the conversations about the HEAL for Immigrant Women and Families Act, you know, the work to develop that, le that legislation, the work to um, really, you know, pioneer new ways to talk about these issues that really speak to our values um, has absolutely been a labor of love by, by many of the organizations that co-hosted this call as well as many more. Um, and, and also that I think that effort has benefited from a lot of the existing coalitions that do this sort of work. Um, so one of the coalitions that, um, you know, that, that does this sort of work, generally speaking, is NCIWR. Um, and uh, along with our co-convener, NAPOF, I think we're going to be looking at ways that NCIWR can um, support uh, this sort of labor of love um, around this, this legislation. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so Priscilla did a fabulous job talking us through what are really, you know, often confusing and complex, you know, patchworks of policies that uh, restrict and in, and in very limited cases allow immigrants access to health care. Um, and so I want to move from the political and from the policy to the personal and, and talk a little bit about what does this mean in the lives of women and families? What does this mean to, to communities and people across the country? Um, so I'm going to talk about some stories, that, and, and the, all of these stories are real people. They're folks that, that I've met that we work with directly um, who are both living with the, the negative consequences of restrictions on immigrant access to health care um, and organizing and mobilizing to fight back. So um, I'll start with uh, Adriana. So Adriana is um, 41 years old. Um, she has lived in the United States for 22 years. Um, five years ago, she was diagnosed with ovarian cysts and told she needed an operation to remove them. Unfortunately, because there was no place for her to go to get health care in the United States, and she lived in Texas, um, she actually crossed into Mexico for the operation and follow-up services. Um, this, is what, this is how she describes it. She says, I would go by myself twice a year and return swimming across the river. So she, she literally swam across the Rio Grande Valley after invasive gynecological surgery. Um, she says, I risked everything crossing that, crossing that river. I risked my life, risked drowning, being assaulted or killed. These days it's too difficult to do that because of how dangerous it has become. Adriana is the sole caretaker and breadwinner for her family, including her two young grandchildren. And just to give you a sense, um, she makes about $250 a month. Um, she continues to feel pain and would, and would like to receive additional health care. Unfortunately, she's too afraid to cross the border. And again, as an immigrant woman, she has no option in this country where she's lived for 22 years to get the health care she needs. Um, and while she's afraid uh, to cross the border, she's also afraid of what, what um, may happen to her grandkids if she can no longer take care of them. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to just take a moment and, and give some, some details around, you know, why, why so much focus on immigrant women and families and specifically on women's health? Um, and you'll hear me talking a lot about the impact of these restrictions on women's health. And, um, and a lot of it has to do with, with demographics and with existing policies. So when you look at the immigrant population, many of you know this by now, but the majority of immigrants, 51%, are women. Um, and within that, immigrants are more likely to be of reproductive age. So the need for things like prenatal care, labor and delivery, postpartum care, contraception, um, cervical cancer screening, I mean, these are much more necessary because we're talking about a population that is right at that uh, reproductive age range. We also know that immigrant women have higher rates of cervical cancer. Um, they also have higher mortality rates of, from cervical cancer. Um, many immigrant women are living in uh, isolated or medically underserved areas. So even if they had insurance, it would be hard to get health care. So they are sort of doubly harmed by the lack of ability to get insurance. 
Um, and we also know that, that the immigration status itself confers a series of barriers and obstacles that make these, that, that really compound the harms of these policies. So we know that um, immigrant women may be vulnerable to violence because um, their immigration status may be held over their head by an abuser. Um, and, and in many cases has a fear of being apprehended while obtaining care. So I think the message here is, you know, if these restrictions that Patel talked about didn't exist, it would still be a struggle for immigrant women to get access to health care. And they, and they continue to be particularly and disproportionately harmed by all these restrictions. Next slide, please. Um, for more detailed information on how these restrictions harm reproductive health, I want to give a shout out to um, my colleague, uh, Kinsey at uh, Guttmacher Institute, who wrote an incredibly illuminating piece um, about the, the, the intersection between legal barriers to health insurance for immigrants and women's and reproductive health care. So if you have not seen this piece, please, please um, take a read. It's, it's got a lot of great information. Um, next slide. And um, just to pull out two charts from that uh, piece that I think are really relevant here, so not only are immigrants disproportionately women and of reproductive age, but immigrant women of reproductive age are particularly likely to be uninsured. So as you see here, um, of non-citizen women of reproductive age, 45% are uninsured, so, so nearly half. Next slide, please. And as you might expect, this only gets worse when we talk about women who are making, who are struggling to make ends meet. Of low-income women, um, the uninsurance rate for non-citizens rises to 60%. So, you know, these sorts of rates of uninsurance are almost unthinkable for many of us in the post-Obamacare world, where you know nearly every other community and population has been able to increase um, their access to coverage. Immigrants have been left behind. Next slide, please. Um, and I'll just take a moment to say, you know, that it, it's um, it's particularly, I think, poignant that so, you know, that the people that we're talking about um, are, you know, they're they're most most immigrants are working. Immigrant women have similar um, levels of labor force participation. Um, all immigrant women and families are paying taxes. They're contributing to the healthcare system that they are completely and utterly locked out of. Um, so, uh, so this is this is Maida. Um, Maida is a 41-year-old mother of three, and um, while being treated for a miscarriage, nurses at the hospital that she was at advised her to get a mammogram. Um, they said that there were some concerning lumps in her breast. Well, um, she went from that examining room to where she thought she'd be able to get the mammogram, and she was told that she would only get it if she could pay up front immediately and in cash. Um, that was five years ago, and Maida has been unable to find any place that will where she can get a mammogram, even as the lumps in her breast have gotten worse. Um, and this is what she said. She said, uh, you know, what we heard was $180, $280, $480. Um, I didn't have it because we just couldn't afford it. No one wanted to help, not anywhere I went. Um, my husband was out of work. We had nothing. We had no help, no money. So I just left it at that. Um, Every day she grows more concerned about developing cancer, and, and now she's starting to feel the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer as well. Um, but again, she remains entirely shut out of any kind of health care option. Um, another woman that we spoke to who also had lumps in her breast was able to get a mammogram, um, but they won't release the results until she can pay the bill. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, we really, we really view as a, as a community organization, as an organization um, devoted to human rights, you know, we really view these restrictions on access to health care for immigrants as grave human rights violations, right? I mean, we're talking about interference with, with the ability to live with health, with dignity, um, you know, free from, free from pain and suffering. Um, this is Lady. Lady is uh, fantastic. She, uh, She's a very fierce activist, um, and she can tell you her last medical bill down to the penny. Um, she can tell you this because it was an emergency room bill that nearly bankrupted her. Um, she was undocumented. She lives in New York City. And she said that she just won't go to the doctor anymore, despite the fact that she lives with chronic pain. Um, and really, she lives to care for her two young sons. Um, but even though they're citizens, her immigration status, coupled with the confusion of social, social service agencies, um, about these complicated policies that Priscilla talked about um, has had disastrous effects on our whole family. Um, so just to give one example, she took her kids to go get immunizations, um, for which they were entirely eligible as U.S. citizens. 
Um, and she was asked for her own papers. And she, and she knew. She knew her rights. She said, you know, my status doesn't have anything to do with this. But um, because the person she was talking to didn't understand the policies, she was, her sons were denied immunizations because of her status. Well, because they couldn't get the shots they needed, they weren't allowed to go to daycare. Because their kids couldn't get into daycare, Lady couldn't work and go to school. So we see the ripple effect of these restrictions on access to healthcare, even even for those who are citizens and technically eligible. Um, but we really see the ripple effects across the entire family. Next slide. All right. So this is this is Esmeralda. Um, so shortly after she delivered her last child, uh, her husband died in a car accident, and so she was left as the sole caretaker and family breadwinner for five children under the age of 11. She's been living in the U.S. for 13 years, but unlike her citizen children, again, similar to Lady, she is undocumented. Um, she admits that her youngest child, now three months old, was not a planned pregnancy. Um, in the past, she had gotten her birth control pills from a, a clinic, but when um, the funding for that clinic was taken away, she could no longer get affordable pills and therefore became pregnant. Um, and I think, you know, what this is the reminder of is that while, you know, things like Title X providers and community health centers are absolutely important, highly, you know, valuable, um, and they provide a, a really vital lifeline for many communities, these programs are simply not designed to meet the full health care needs of women and families, and they're not a substitute for quality, affordable health coverage. Um, you know, women in similar situations who were unable to get access to birth control, um, we've heard stories about uh, two sisters who were sharing their pills. They would each take a pill every other day in hopes that, you know, maybe together they could, uh, they could afford that and maybe that would prevent pregnancy. Um, those of you who, don't, who aren't uh, versed in reproductive health, I can tell you that that will not prevent pregnancy. Next slide, please. So you heard Priscilla talk about DACA, um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So this is Angie. Um, Angie is a dreamer. Um, she's DACA eligible. Um, and you know, because, because of the DACA program, in theory, she has the opportunity to work, to go to school, um, to eventually you know, help support her family. But she doesn't have access to health care, right? Because while, you know, even though DACA eligible folks, you know, going through the program would be considered lawfully present, um, they're specifically carved out of health care. And I think that this, you know, as do many of the policies, but the, the DACA exclusion in particular really underscores the hypocrisy and harm of some of these policies, right? Because the message is even if you're lawfully present and even if you're authorized to live and work and go to school in this country, you know, you better not get hurt or sick, because if you do, you're out of luck. Next slide. Um, so, you know, needless to say, this has a huge impact on families. It has an impact on undocumented families, on lawfully present families, on mixed status families, on the friends and neighbors and caretakers and loved ones who are connected to those who are denied health care. Um, and so, you know, while, while it is an individual who was denied care because of their, their coverage and because of their individual status, um, it is something that ripples out into families, into communities, and into our entire society. Um, and it's really something that, you know, we as a community must address because it, it, it in many ways affects us all. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to close with a, a couple other thoughts on sort of, you know, zooming out um, in terms of, you know, how do the community stories play into the broader policy discussion and then what's some of the work that's going on to fight back. Um, so, you know, many of us uh, on this call today and, and um, part of this effort really see immigration policies as central to women's equality and we see health care as intrinsic to that agenda. Um, one of our activists recently said, uh, you know, we were talking about immigrant access to health care and she goes, you know, didn't the president just say when women succeed, America succeeds? Um, and, you know, we don't think that immigrant women can succeed without access to health care, and we certainly don't think that we can succeed without immigrant women. Next slide. Um, a another barrier to health care that I just want to mention quickly because I think it, it um, compounds some of the restrictions we've talked about. So. Um, there's a particular kind of denial of access that's happening for folks who live along the border, and that's because of checkpoints. Um, so you'll see on the slide those white dots represent um, internal uh, within the United States checkpoints. And so what that means is that you know if you are an immigrant woman or um, who you know doesn't have access to health care, but 
let's say you're able to find a clinic, you know, four hours away where you can get some care. Um, well, if you have to cross a checkpoint, you're not going to be able to get there because, you know, you would, you would be stopped and, and asked for your status. Um, so I think that this is a reminder that, you know, draconian enforcement, again, um, has a, a really awful symbiotic um, effect along with user certainty on access to health care, kind of making each one worse. Next slide. So, um, and click again, please. So just a few quick words on some of the work that we're doing to organize uh, women and families to fight back against these restrictions. Um, this was a, a piece of art that was created by the Strong Families Coalition, um, uh, pointing out some of the limitations in the Senate bill and you know, really calling out that when we talk about years and years of delay for access to health care, that has a real impact on, on people and on their families. Next slide. So we at National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, we are organizing Latinas across the country, um, immigrant women, undocumented women. They're speaking out. They're telling their stories, um, you know, whether they're coming to Congress to talk about these policies directly to policymakers or, or organizing in their own hometowns. Um, they, you know, they are part of the solution. They are part of addressing the barriers that are affecting them most of all. Um, if, I'll put in a quick plug. If you haven't seen our Nuestro Texas report, check it out, nuestrotexas.org. Um, it includes uh, many stories from women in Texas who are dealing with restrictions on access because of their immigration status um, and, and really helps to, to point out how there are human rights violations. And next slide. Uh, one of our favorite activists, um, and, and Poderosa, as we call them, is Paula Saldana, um, who was actually featured on the Rachel Maddow show on Friday night. We're all very proud of her. Um, and uh, she's a promotora. She's a, she's a health educator. Um, you know, and her perspective on this issue is that she goes door to door educating her community about, you know, here's how you do a breast self-exam. Here's how you can tell if you have the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. Um, and the most heartbreaking thing about her job is that while she can educate a woman to look for lumps in her breast, if that woman has no status and is cut off from access to health care, she has nowhere to send that woman. So here she is empowering and educating women, um, but they have nowhere to go. And last slide, please. So I'm actually going to close with um, words from another, another one of the women that we've been talking to. Her name is Rosa. Um, and, you know, she talks about, you know, what is it like to get continually turned away from clinics because of your immigration status? And she says, having doors shut on you everywhere makes you feel like you're in the desert, a desert where there's no help, no one to lend a hand. So uh, here's hoping that working together we can start to lend a hand to these communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, those are some quite powerful stories from the communities that are being directly impacted by the policies. Um, Siobhan, at this point, I'd like to turn it on over to you. Thanks so much, Jodanae, and thank you so much, Kimberly, for sharing those stories with us. I think it's so important that we always remember the real people in our families and communities that are impacted by these policies. So I'll be talking you through messages we've crafted for talking about this issue in the best way, as well as uh, things that are being done to address the problems and how you can take part. Slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so before I get into all of that, I did want to talk about the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, where I work, and uh, about the AAPI stake in immigrant women's health. So NAPOF is the only national multi-issue Asian and Pacific Islander women's organization in the country. And our mission is to build a movement to advance social justice and human rights for Asian American and Pacific Islander women and girls. And we do that through leadership development, grassroots organizing, research, and policy advocacy. And we've been working with the Latina Institute through the National Coalition for Immigrant Women's Rights around this issue for a while now because it is an issue that is so important for our community. I think when folks think about immigration, they don't automatically think about Asians. But we know that um, our community is now 
coming as immigrants to the United States in numbers that are higher than the Latino community, that we have very, very high rates of uninsurance in many of our communities, and that there are subpopulations of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders that are living in poverty. So immigration is definitely an issue for us, and having insurance for health care is um, a priority for our community. Um, slide, please. So with that, I'll get into some of the messaging. Of course, as many of you know, this can be a difficult issue to talk about. And even though a majority, 63%, based on a CASER poll of the American population believes immigrants with provisional legal status should be eligible for Medicaid, this still isn't easy to talk about with lawmakers. Thankfully, there are good messages that we have, um, and we're happy to share them with you today. So the messaging that I'm going to be talking about comes from work done by the National Coalition of Immigrant Women's Rights over the years, as well as research-based messages developed by Belden Rusinello, strategist for the National Immigration Law Center. So what you're seeing here is a message triangle. These are the three main messages we think resonate most with people around this issue. Two of these, the fair treatment points, up there at the top and the families points on the right are really value based and invoke the values of fairness and family that we know many Americans share. And the, the third point down there on the left is a more practical one, if you will, that centers around the economic benefit for everyone when women and families have the health care that they need. So I'm going to go a little bit more in depth. So the first point, this is about fair treatment. This really focuses on the idea that immigrants are already paying their fair share. They work hard, they pay taxes that support the health care system, and they should be able to benefit from what they put in. They should be treated fairly by the system they contribute to, essentially. And uh, another point here is that anyone can get hurt or sick. So everyone should have access to the care they need. No one should be living in fear that an accident or an illness could threaten their family's stability and turn their lives upside down. Additionally, um, under this fairness point, we talk about um, how the five-year bar really is inhumane and goes against human rights. We know early child health is an important predictor for health and longevity, and five years could also be the difference between life and death for a woman facing breast or cervical cancer. I'll go now to the next point. We all benefit from this. We know it's better and more affordable for all of us when immigrants can participate in the system their tax dollars already support. Affordable health coverage improves access to preventive care and puts less strain on costly emergency services. And we know that when more of us have health coverage, our workforce is healthier and our economy is stronger. And that denying coverage does not eliminate the need for care. Women still need care and their families still need care. Without health insurance, immigrant communities may delay care for preventable diseases leading to higher costs and greater suffering. So I'll move now to the point that this is important for women and families. We know that immigrant women are disproportionately harmed by the barriers to care. They're more likely to be low income, of reproductive age, and uninsured. Barriers to affordable coverage increase the risk of negative sexual, reproductive, and maternal health outcomes with lasting economic consequences for immigrant women and their families. We also know that when mom is healthy, the whole family benefits. So, you know, as a, a a person coming from an immigrant family myself, I know that immigrant women are the backbones of our families and communities, and they're really the drivers of integration. They're the ones that are encouraging their families to learn English, to do well in school and business, and to pursue naturalization, to go through the citizenship process. 
So when immigrant women can participate in the health care they already pay their fair share for, and when they can make decisions about their own reproductive health, they're better able to care for their children and their family members, making the whole community stronger. Furthermore, we know that immigrant women are important contributors to the economy and they therefore deserve equal opportunity. They're more likely to start businesses than non-immigrant women are and are also a vital part of our service economy. Next slide, please. So I want to go now into a, a list of do's and don'ts or what to avoid and what to say instead. And one thing we really want to avoid saying is that these policies are unfair. So you can say immigrant women should, um, there should be fair treatment, but you want to stay away from the word unfair because when it was tested, folks thought that it sounded whiny <laughs> and um, it didn't resonate with a lot of people. Instead, you want to say, um, immigrants pay taxes and should be able to benefit from the programs that their taxes support. You also want to avoid talking about punishing people by not giving benefits, which invokes this idea that immigrants have done something wrong in order to be punished. So you really want to stay away from that and instead talk about people working and contributing to our communities. Also, avoid saying that including immigrants would be cheaper because they are younger and healthier because what we found is that uh, <laughs> the American public doesn't want to hear that uh, they're not healthy and that immigrants are healthier than they are and younger than they are. So um, instead you want to say it'll be better and more affordable for all of us if immigrants are contributing to their health care and getting the care that they need. And the last thing to avoid here is going too far by claiming that preventive care is cheap or will make people healthy because that sounds to folks like it is a little too extreme, not completely believable. You really want to stick to saying that allowing immigrants to be a part of the system will mean that they're more likely to get primary care and not depend on expensive emergency rooms. Next slide, please. <laughs> so uh, we're in a very exciting place right now. Congressman Michelle Lujan Grisham from New Mexico has really become a champion for this issue and uh, we've been working with her to introduce proactive legislation around it. She publicly announced her intent to introduce legislation and we are very, very much looking forward to supporting her with this as it moves forward. Um, you know, we usually are on the defense <laughs> in the reproductive justice, health rights and uh, community. Um, and it's not every day that we have a Congress member who is coming out so boldly and proposing things that we can be for. It's, it's always us fighting against something. So we feel very grateful, appreciative, and excited that uh, the Congresswoman has come forward and is doing this. Um, we have a diverse group of organizations that have come together to support this, from reproductive rights, health, and justice groups, to immigrant rights groups, to family groups, who've all given their support. Um, at this time, the details of the legislation are still being worked out, and we're unfortunately not able to share legislative language, but we welcome you to join our list so that you're kept in the loop about what's happening, and when the time comes, we can ask you to endorse the bill. Next slide, please. So if you do want to join our list and uh, uh, be kept apprised of what's happening, what our next steps are, and what you can do around this legislative effort in particular, um, email Natalie Camastra at the Latina Institute. It's natalie at latinainstitute.org. You'll see her email on this slide here. And if you would like to join NCIWR, um, you can visit our website to learn more about us and join at nciwr.org. And I will leave it there and turn it back over to you, Dana. Thank you so much, Shivana.
we've covered a lot of information. Um, and now we're going to try and open it up for some questions. And just as a reminder uh, for everyone to go ahead and type your questions into the chat function, it should be on the right side of your screen. If you want, you can indicate um, if the question is directed at a certain speaker. Otherwise, I'm going to kind of open it up to anyone. We do have a number of questions already and only a few minutes to get through them. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, Priscilla, I think this one may be for you. Um, are U visa recipients, self-petitioners, or battered spouse waiver recipients eligible for the ACA? Are these populations subject to the same five-year bar? They are eligible for the ACA, for marketplace coverage, and they are not subject to the five-year bar. Great, thank you. Um, and then I'm going to throw this one um, open to anybody. It's about Vermont Single Payer Program. Um, so the question is, Vermont Single Payer Program is extended to undocumented immigrants. How did they do this, and how well is it working? Hmm. Okay, sounds like something we may need to look into. Um, did any of the speakers want to jump in? Okay, well, we'll go ahead and move on just because we're short on time. But um, to the uh, person who did write that in, uh, we'll try and actually find you know somebody who may be able to answer that for you. Um, so another comment here. Do you think it's important to disaggregate immigrant groups by region or origin? Immigrants from South or Central America may have different needs compared to African immigrants. Siobhan, I'm wondering if you want to take this one? In terms of talking about like subpopulations? Hi, this is Shivana. I can I can take that. Um, so this aggregation is actually something that the AAPI community is very, very keen on. And in our policy priorities as a community, we always lift that up for our um, our lawmakers because our community is so diverse and we're so often um, looked at as a monolith. And we know that the reality is that so many of our communities um, are struggling to, to make ends meet, and that is not reflected in um, the, uh, the narrative that's told about us. So we very much are a proponent of uh, disaggregation, and I think that generally it makes sense to disaggregate data so that you're getting the most accurate picture of what's happening. Great. Thank you, Shivana. Um, and of course, we have a question here about getting copies of the webinar presentations. And I don't want to speak for each of the um, presenters. So um, if you, I assume they will be available. Um, do you each want to kind of speak to that real quickly? This is Kimberly, yes. This is Priscilla, yes. OK, so it sounds like we will be able to go ahead and share those out. Um, thank you for flagging that for us. Um, so another question here, how does this effort um, fit into the larger conversation on immigration reform? This is Kimberly. I can take that one. Um, you know, so I think that uh, you know we could have a whole other webinar about like where the national conversation is about immigration reform and what's going on on the Hill versus what's going on with administration advocacy. Um, but I think you know we really see the the effort around this proactive legislation as creating a space that doesn't currently exist to have a meaningful, informed conversation about access to health care. Um, so in many ways, you know. Obviously, it's, it's related, but we do see it as opening up a new political and rhetorical space um, to have a conversation that, that's frankly not been adequately addressed by the mainstream discussion. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. And then one last question. Um, are there safety net programs that immigrants can already access? Yeah, this is, this is Shana. There, there are safety net providers that do um, play an important role in giving 
services to underserved populations, including immigrant women. Um, but you know, immigrant women should really be able to participate in the health coverage programs that their tax dollars are supporting. And even though these safety net providers exist, um, it's, it's not enough to meet the need and the demands that we're seeing. OK, thank you. Um, so that is, those are the questions that we have so far. I just want to give people one last chance to go ahead and chat in their questions. David and A, as people are doing that, this is Priscilla, I um, would lo love to just add to Kimberly's comment earlier about how um, the Lujan Grisham bill fits into the larger immigration reform context. I think um, you know, one of the lessons learned for, I think, a lot of us who worked on um, passing the ACA um, was that, you know, at, at that time, the, the, the instruction given to many of us was um, to stay silent on coverage for immigrants um, because, you know, it, it, there are a lot of myths and stereotypes and it triggers um, a negative reaction and, um, because we, because we did stay silent in the hope that we could quietly um, address some of the issues, I, it left a space open for um, people who want to further restrict access to come in and take over that space. And um, from my perspective, I think that's the reason why we had the notorious Joe Wilson moment. Um, and indeed, once that had happened, even um, uh, the, the bill, the, the Affordable Care Act, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act actually did change in its substance um, in an effort to try to address um, the, the concern that Joe Wilson had mentioned, even though um, it really wasn't even an issue to begin with. Um, so, you know, I think we, um, we took that to heart. Um, and I think when we start to work on immigration reform in the House, um, you know, we're looking for um, champions and people um, uh, both in the community and our congressional members on the Hill to really um, not, not leave that space open again and really demand um, that we use legislation to further address and fill in those gaps, not to create more restrictions. Um, thank you, Priscilla, for kind of expanding on that. We do have one last question, and uh, people are wondering what um, they can do to um, get involved. Action items. What what can they do to help efforts? So this is Kimberly. Um, so I think for right now, you know, if you're not currently on the email list, if you're not getting information about this. Um, please uh, do email Natalie at latininstitute.org so that you can make sure to be included. Um, you know, where we are right now is we're in, a, we're in a little bit of a pause as we wait for the Congresswoman to figure out, you know, the timing and the final the language. Um, as soon as we have that, though, we're going to be looking at co-sponsor pushes, at grassroots ad advocacy, at communications work. Um, so, so I think it's, you know, join us, and, and as soon as we get the green light on all of that, bigger advocacy work, um, it'll be full steam ahead. Um, so we'll be doing some of that planning the next um, days and, and uh, weeks. And so um, join us for that. And there'll be lots and lots to do. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. A few other questions have come in, but we are running a little short of time. And I want to be respectful of that. So for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, um, again, we will try and follow up with you um, afterwards. So um, with, with that, I just want to thank all of our speakers, um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope that this webinar will be helpful uh, for your work moving forward, and definitely stay tuned for more information. So thanks again.